Oh, not me recording <laughs> pretty much all of this and then realizing that my camera stopped recording halfway through. So we're just starting fresh. We're just starting fresh because I feel like the first take was a little chaotic. So, hi y'all. My name is Kayla and welcome to my cozy cat corner of the internet. So in today's video, we are doing the wrap up for May. This is my first ever reading wrap up. It is officially June 2nd. So that means any book I read pretty much from yesterday on counts for June and is not a part of May. So let's just start cracking in to the books that I read in May. But before we do that, I do want to kind of go over my rating system because I know everyone has different rating systems. So I think it's helpful to understand where each individual reader comes from when they say they give a book four stars versus five stars, and so on and so forth. I do want to note that I do not give half or quarter star ratings. I only do full star, whole star ratings. So with that in mind, let's start with five stars. What does that mean for Kayla? That means I believe that this book is 100% perfection and I have zero notes. There's nothing that I would change about this book. Four stars is pretty similar to five stars in the sense that I really loved the book. I enjoyed it. I thought it was almost perfect, but there's some critiques, some notes, some thoughts, opinions that I have about that book that I think could potentially make the book better. Three stars is it was all right. I didn't love it, but I also didn't hate it. Two stars is it was a book that I read. And then one stars means I I wish I wish I never read this book. Why did I read this book? That's kind of how my star rating works. So with that out of the way, I hope you guys find that helpful when I am listing off different stars about different books. It kind of adds a little more context behind why I gave a book four stars versus five stars, etc, etc. I do want to note that my neighbor's child is outside singing her little heart out. So if you guys can hear that, she's just living her best life. But with that noted, we are going to be starting off with a few books that I DNF'd in the month of May. And the very first one is Cave of Bones by Anne Hillerman. I did ultimately give this one star. And I do want to know, I feel like there's some discourse on if you DNF a book, should you be allowed to actually give it a star rating? I think that if you DNF a book, you should still be allowed to give it a rating. But I do think that you do have to like, give a little additional context on why you gave it that rating. Um, I think the reason you can give any book a rating that you start reading is you did put time and effort into the book, right? You did start to read the book. That is why I believe that even if you don't finish a book, you should still be able to give it some sort of rating and be able to express why you didn't finish the book. So let me know in the comments down below, what are your thoughts and opinions on rating books that you didn't actually finish reading. Anyways, on to Cave of Bones. I did give this one star and I just want to explain a little bit more about Cave of Bones in general. So Cave of Bones is part of a detective series based in the Four Corners region of the United States. If you don't know what the Four Corners region is, it is where Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and Arizona meet. There's literally, they all have their little points that meet perfectly in the four corners. This book um, does predominantly delve into, I believe, the Navajo tribe, if I remember correctly. And the book starts out with this girl in a cave and they're doing um, what is alluded to as like a common practice amongst this youth group and the youth group takes these teenagers out into the desert and like they all kind of like go into their own little caves, their own little areas and just kind of like meditate and reconnect with themselves. And the girl that we start the book out with, she is in her cave and she keeps saying she's just surrounded by bones. And then we cut to the like youth group leaders and all like the kids are back with them, except for this one girl. There's another um, employee with the youth group who he's also missing. <laughs> and eventually we get the girl back and that's pretty much as, not as far as I got. I did get further than that. But the reason that I stopped reading this book was kind of twofold. I should state 
that Cave of Bones is technically, I believe, book two or three in a detective series. And typically for me, I find that most, not all, but most detective books, you can read them out of order. Like, I've read detective books where I'm like reading book five and it's technically about like a 10 book series, but it didn't feel like it. It felt like it was easily a standalone book. So with that noted, I don't know if I felt out of place reading Cave of Bones because I should have started with book one or if they're all just kind of written in this particular way. And it felt kind of like I was reading a textbook. There was a lot of telling and not a lot of showing. It was a lot of historical context to the Four Corners region and the native tribes of that region. And then when we had any sort of character interactions, it was kind of, it just, you f I felt really disconnected from the characters. And I don't know if that's because we just didn't have enough context behind the characters and we would have gotten it further in the book. Or if it's because I should have started with book one to really understand like the characters that were being discussed because characters were just kind of like plopped into scenes and I was just like am I supposed to know who this person is because there was no you know how some a lot of times when you're introduced to a character for the first time it's like Marjorie with her wild blue hair and her crazy brown eyes and her free willed spirit you know you get some sort of context behind the character and I felt like there wasn't any of that with Cave of Bones ultimately I did just end up putting the book down because I felt like there was no character building I felt like there was no story building and I felt like it was kind of more just a textbook and ultimately I gave it one star because I just have no interest in picking it up again and I really don't have any interest in reading the series as a whole. Moving on to the two star category. Our first one is a brief history of several boyfriends. It's just a bunch of short stories. And when I say short stories, they're like two to three pages long short stories. They're, they're just like quick little sprinkles of stories. The reason first and foremost I DNF'd it is because I'm not really one to just sit down and read short stories. That's just not not my cup of tea. I really do enjoy sitting down and like having a full-on storyline, a full character arc. I, that's the type of reading I partake in. The second reason outside of it being just short stories is because the two stories that I did read were about these women who are in relationships with men who just absolutely did not treat them right but the women knew they weren't being treated right and still stayed with the men and that was just infuriating right it's one thing to be in like a toxic relationship and not really know you're in a toxic relationship and it's another to be in a toxic relationship and carry on in that toxic relationship especially because i believe in both of the instances they weren't married to these men the men themselves were actually married had their own families and these were their mistresses and it was just like and it's not even like they were spoiling them it's like it's like, uh, uh, i have so many thoughts and opinions it's not like they were spoiling the mistresses it's not like these were their sugar babies and they were just like getting spoiled out of it like one of the women literally was with this doctor man and she would literally buy his groceries she would pay his bills this is a full-grown man with a full-grown job who could easily take care of himself and you're the one with like the job that clearly doesn't pay anywhere close to his um and yet you're still taking care of him and what does he do for you what does he do for you and so the stories i was reading was just making me mad <laughs> like i'm not gonna keep reading a a bunch of story types that i don't like and b a bunch of stories that are making me infuriated so up next we have and there he kept her by joshua moling the reason i dnf this book because i got pretty far into it i think i got 30 almost 40 percent into this book before i stopped reading it and the reason I stopped reading it is because we met our bad guy very early on. And not only did we meet our bad guy very early on, we were getting his point of view. A bulk of the book we spent with Detective Packard. And I actually really liked Ben Packard's 
point of view. I liked his storyline. I liked where things were going. But I think about through four chapters in, we all of a sudden had a new point of view. And it was from the man who was holding a teenage girl captive. And fun fact, it's not his first time. There were times where you were literally almost made to feel sympathetic and sorry towards Emmett, who's the bad guy. I don't like to feel bad or feel sorry for serial killers. Is that weird? Is that weird? Is that weird? So the reason I might pick this up again is because, again, I really enjoyed Ben Packard's point of view, and he is the detective in this book. I think I would have kept reading this book if instead of having it be a first person perspective for Emmett, it was a third person perspective for Emmett. Um, like we were being more told about Emmett instead of having Emmett tell us about Emmett, if that makes any sense. The only reason I would like even, I'm even mulling around the idea of returning to it is because I think there was only two chapters that were from Emmett's perspective and they aren't very long chapters. So I think if the book kind of like keeps that rhythm, that pacing of mostly Packard's per point of view and like sprinkles of Emmett, I think I can handle it a little later on. But in the month of May, I just had, I had no patience to be dealing with this whiny serial killer. <laughs> The final two star is Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. And the reason I'm giving this one two stars is because I quite frankly don't remember much about this book. I just remember rolling my eyes so far in the back of my head pretty much the entirety of this book. The main female lead was really aloof, really she'd pick me. She had pick me energy. And the guy that she was like fawning over was kind of just like a prick. Every time he was talking, I was so annoyed with him. And I was like, no way is this, no way is this the guy that she's chasing after. No way is this the guy she's, because there's like two, or there's like a pseudo love triangle situation going on. And I was like, no, because the other guy was like, okay, he's like, mildly annoying and probably slightly clingy but uh he's not a dick unlike the other guy the other guy was kind of like Ugh. i could not stand him i could i i had in the margins of the book it was nothing but me being annoyed and frustrated so that's all i remember of the, about this book that's all i remember about this book to be quite frank which is really sad i was really upset and sad at the end of this book because i love pride and prejudice so much so I'm really hoping that this month, in the month of June, that Jane can redeem herself because I am reading Mansfield Park for my June TBR. And I'm just really hoping that like, I'm really hoping that one doesn't let me down because North Anger Abbey really let me down. Up next, we have The Hawthorne Legacy by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This is actually part of a series, and I read The Inheritance Game, which is part one of the series in January of 2023, so over a year ago, and I really enjoyed that book. It was really fun and interesting, so I'm going to give a quick synopsis about The Inheritance Games. So The Inheritance Games follows the life of a teenage girl and out of the blue randomly one day she is told that she is inheriting the estate of a billionaire a multi-gazillion billionaire dude man and the thing is our main character never met the dude is related to the dude no clue who he is why is she getting his entire estate? And the tricky part about this is the multi-billion gazillion billionaire dude, he had kids. He had a couple daughters. His daughters had kids. So it's not like he didn't have people in the family to give, to, to give his money to. And also, fun fact, um, what they did get in his will, it wasn't it wasn't much. So in the inheritance game, we spend a majority of the book with our main female lead working with his grandchildren, 
to solve puzzles because he was a big puzzle guy. He liked games. They were solving games and puzzles to try and figure out why she was selected to get his inheritance. And that story continues on in book two. I did give the inheritance games five stars because it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. I felt like it had a lot of good puzzle building. It was very interesting in that sense. And while that did carry on into book three, did I say book three? Book two. I feel like it was kind of the same old, same old, like it was just like a continuation of book one. And I felt like there wasn't really anything new or interesting brought to the table. It was kind of all very almost expected. So I am intrigued to see what we get in book three because book two did end with kind of like a little bit of a twist but nothing earth shattering in my personal opinion. But yeah, it was just like, it was a good book. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. Three stars. Next, we're heading on into our four stars. We have None of This is True by Lisa Jewell. Quick synopsis of this. We have two women who are the exact same age, born on the exact same day, in the exact same hospital. 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 We have Josie, who is a mom kind of sort of just a nobody. And then we have Alex, who is a famous podcast host. They live very different lives. And Josie proposes to Alex because they do eventually meet in their 45 years of existence. And Josie proposes to Alex saying, hey, I think I could be a really good person to have on your podcast, just like just an episode. And the more Alex gets to know Josie, the more she's like, you know what? I don't think you'd be a good one episode character. I think we could make a whole new series on you. So they delve down this rabbit hole and <clears throat> things start to go awry. We start to learn a little bit more details about both characters, to be quite frank. And uh, things start to get dug up. People start to drop like flies. And we spend the entire book on the edge of our seats, or at least I was on the edge of my seat. And the only reason I gave this book four stars instead of five, is because of the last three pages. Our next four star book is Johannes Cabal, The Necromancer. And y'all, this was such a fun, dark comedy. It was so, so fun. Oh my god, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much. And the only, again, the only reason I gave it four stars versus five stars is because there was a section towards the end of the book, you were past the halfway point, but you probably still had you had anywhere from 50 to 75% left of the book. And there was just a section where you're just kind of like, okay, let's just let's speed it up a little. Let's speed, we can either cut this part out, speed it up a little, or I don't know. But other than that, it was fantastic. I had so much fun. The story is about Johannes Cabal, who is a necromancer. And it just so happens that he had sold his soul to the devil to become a necromancer. Well, the story starts out, literally chapter one, Johannes Cabal is literally just, hello, Mr. Satan, telling Satan, listen, buddy, listen, listen, uh, love that we have this little deal, love being a necromancer, but I'm gonna need you to give me back my soul. But I also have to be able to keep my necromancer abilities. Listen here, Johannes. I love a good deal. I love a good deal. I love, yeah, I love a good deal. I can do that for you. I'd love to do that for you. However, you have to get me a hundred souls. And to make things like a little fair, a little even, um, I'm gonna give you a year to get me a hundred souls. And, but you can't just kill them. Like they have to sign over their soul. And he's like, you know what? I'm gonna help you out a little bit more. Just, just a little bit more. And I'm gonna give you a carnival a traveling carnival, sometimes the downtrodden, the questionable morales, people who, you know, may not be the greatest of people go to carnivals. And I think you, you, this will be helpful for you. This will be helpful for you. What you don't know about Johannes is that he is a very buttoned up, straightforward man of science, and he doesn't really have what it takes to run a carnival. So we spend the book <laughs> <laughs> with Johannes and his ragtag team just traveling in their traveling carnival uh, collecting souls <laughs> and it was such a fun story I had such a good time it is part of a series I think the second book is called 
Johannes Cabal, the detective. And I'm definitely going to be reading that book next. It, it was so fun. It was such a good read. I definitely recommend it if you're into comedy, if you're into the macabre, and if you're into both of those things coexisting at the same time. <laughs> Up next, we have Snow Globe by So Young Park. I will note that this is originally written in Korean and was translated to English. It is a young adult dystopian novel, and it is a part of a duology as far as I am aware. There's nothing that's alluding it to it being anything longer than a duology. And I will note that the English translation for the second book does come out in spring of 2025, and I cannot wait. For spring of 2025. This story follows a world, our world, that has gone into an ice age. The temperature of the world is roughly always at negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty much everyone is living in a frozen tundra. But there is what is called the snow globe, which is climate regulated, and very select people get to live in the snow globe. And the situation with the snow globe is that if you live in the snow globe, you are also technically then an actor who you are the entertainment for the people outside of the snow globe. Residents within the snow globe don't watch snow globe television, but everyone on the outside watches what's going on in the world of the snow globe. So dystopian Hunger Games meets The Truman Show. There was a comparison on the back actually it says the Hunger Games meets Squid Game. And I would not agree with that statement. I would say The Hunger Games meets The Truman Show. I don't get the Squid Game reference. If the Squid Game reference is literally just because it's written by a Korean author, you might want to brush up on your pop culture references there, Entertainment Weekly. But, man. This was such a good book. So, oh my god. And here's the reason why I didn't get five stars and only got four stars. For the most part, it didn't feel a young adult, right? Like, you're dealing with 16-year-olds in it. Like, our main character is a 16, 17-year-old. It didn't feel like you're really dealing with um, teenage, young adult energy, I'll say. But there were a few instances where, like, just little sayings, certain sentence here or there... There would just be times where you just kind of get pulled out of it and be reminded, like, this is about a 16-year-old girl. Four stars. It's pretty stinking good. It is nearly perfect. I just had, I had some notes. <laughs> so I absolutely love this book. I 10 out of 10 recommend this book. I really don't want to give any spoilers about this book because I think it's so good. And I know so many of you have mentioned in comments down below of videos where I have talked about this book, about like you're adding it to your TBR because I had even just mentioned it, I think you should put it on your TBR. Especially if you love dystopian books. If you love, I would say almost mystery. There's some mystery elements in this book. And I would say if you're into almost like political world building, it's not a lot, but it's there. And I think it's going to almost get there a little more in the second book. But we'll see. But this was this was a fun one. I enjoyed this one. And I am very excited for part two to come out. Our next book is a book I had zero intention of reading, but it just so happened to be at my library on a shelf. And anytime there's a new release at the library, you better believe I'm snagging that up real quick because they are almost impossible to get without waiting in a hold line for five months. <laughs> and that is Just for the Summer by Abby Jimenez. I have not read Abby Jimenez before. This is my very first experience with her. And this story follows Alex and Justin, who have have this little problem. They seem to be the person that you date before you find your soulmate. So they're just always kind of like dating. So they're like, hey, why don't we just date each other? And maybe our curses will like counteract each other. And the next person we date will be our soulmate. We follow their story. <laughs> and it was so good. It was so good. I will note this is based in Minnesota, predominantly, predominantly in the Twin Cities. And Sydney actually mentioned that 
one of her qualms with this book was that she didn't really get the world building aspect to it. And I also felt that way. And I wasn't sure if I felt that way because I'm from the Twin Cities. So I know these places very well. And very specific places that were being mentioned in this book, like the Stone Arch Bridge or Stillwater or Lake Minnetonka was like these places were being mentioned, but they weren't being described at all. And I was like, am I feeling that way because I'm from these places and I know these places very well. And it was pretty much just like, oh yeah, I'm on the Stone Arch Bridge and it's very beautiful. And I'm like, the Stone Arch Bridge, that area, you could you could say so much about those areas. Stillwater, so quaint, such a quaint, cute little town off the river. You could say so much about it. It's like, oh yeah, we went antique vintage shopping in Stillwater. There was no description of these cute little places you were in. I'm like, am I feeling that way because I'm from the, I'm from here? Or would I have felt that way if it was any other place? Like if she was talking about Florida, and if she was saying, oh yeah, we were on Panama Beach and that was it. I'm glad that Sydney also felt that way, that there wasn't really world building going on at all because that made me feel more secure in my sense of like, am I feeling this way because I'm from here or am I feeling this way because it's not happening? And it's because it wasn't happening. <laughs> but other than that, outside of that factor, I feel like the character development was so so good. It was phenomenal. It was amazing. If you are the type of person who you don't need world building at all, you just love a good character storyline, just for the summer is for you. But if you do need a little bit more world building, a little bit more understanding of the places you are in, just keep in mind that that doesn't really happen in this book. Speaking of world building though, Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. This, for me, was five stars. The storyline of this. I don't even know how to explain the storyline of this without giving spoilers. So all I'm gonna say is it is about six teenagers. It is teenagers, this is a young adult book, but it doesn't feel like a young adult book in any capacity. It's about six teenagers who live a rough and tum in a rough and tumble world. They're a part of a gang and they are given the proposition of like, hey, you guys are some of the best thieves in the business. So I need you to go to this impenetrable fortress and steal something for me. And if you do it, you're gonna get rained upon, okay? The coin is coining. <laughs> I think it's coins. They're like, bet, all right, bet. And so, you know, we follow the tale of these six kids who uh, attempt to do the impossible. And it was such a fun book. I already have Crooked Kingdom. I have heard though that Crooked Kingdom is not as good as Six of Crows, but I just need to know what happens. I need to know what happens. I loved these characters so much. They were all so very different and very dynamic. This is my first Leigh Bardugo. Um, so if you think there are other books of hers that I should absolutely read, let me know. And I'll add them. I'll add them to, <laughs> I'll add them to my ever growing list, but. Six of Crows was really good. Up next, we have Recursion by Blake Crouch. And this was, it was such a good book. It was not what I was expecting. It is about this detective who lost his child and ended up divorcing his wife because they just couldn't deal with the fact that their child was killed in a hit and run. And he is living his life just living his life being a detective in New York. And then there is a character of a scientist who wants to work on a project for, I believe, memory rehabilitation because her mother is slowly but surely succumbing to the effects of dementia. And she is trying to build like this memory chair to help her mother pretty much. Um, but things start to go awry when the memory chair project turns into time travel. Yeah, it gets wild. It's intense. It's like the last probably 30% of the book. I mean, the whole book is amazing, but the last 30% you're just like, what the? 
oh my god it was just it was oh i was on the seat i wasn't read i wasn't physically reading it i was listening to audiobook and i was just like i think my jaw was a jar the entire time i just remember at the end of that book being like breathless and anytime a book just creates any sort of m massive emotion in me like that, I'm like, this just, it did its job. You know what I mean? It did its job. Another five star read for me was The Woman in Cabin 10 by Ruth Ware. Y'all, this was I've never read Ruth Ware before. The turns that turned were not what I was expecting to be turning. Other people may be like, Kayla, that was so obvious. But for me, it was not obvious. So this starts out with a woman who's a journalist. She goes on the cruise for her boss and is a very small, very exclusive cruise for the most elite of elite. While she's on the, uh, the cruise, she has a night where she may have been, you know, consuming one too many adult beverages, but she gets back to her cabin and she hears what sounds like someone going overboard. And the next day, or you think even that night, she tells the security like, uh, this person went overboard and security took things pretty serious at first. And they look into the matter, a head count, everyone's accounted for, everyone's there, everyone's accounted for. And she is adamant that someone went overboard. And so we pretty much spend the entire book of her trying to convince everyone someone went overboard, someone is missing, and we got to figure out who. And the turns and the turns and the turns this book took, this was a good one. This was a good one. And our last book for the month of May was, quite frankly... So recursion left me breathless and my mouth ajar. Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies just left me like feeling all warm and fuzzy inside. And I just had like the biggest smile on my face. This was such a fun book. It was such a fun book. It was such a good book. So we follow the character of Emily, who is a professor, an educator in the world of fairies. And she goes to northern something she is there to learn about the fairies just the character building in this book it had really good world building but the characters is what just like stuck with me about this book um so we have emily who's a professor she's very studious she's very smart book wise but not 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 street smart the thing is everyone explains her, this story and the trope of like <clears throat> grumpy grumpy meets sunshine because there is Wimbledon <laughs> I was mixing his first and last name Wendell Bambleby <laughs> um so we have the grumpy Emily Wilds and we have the sunshine Wendell Bambleby and I would like to reverse that I would like to uno reverse that Bambleby is the sweetest sunshine rainbow fairy ever we love him but Emily I don't like that, like, even in the book, it says a curmudgeonly professor. I don't like that. I think Emily is socially awkward. I think she, again, is very, very smart, very, very intelligent, but just isn't, she doesn't have those people, people skills, which is fair and valid. And nowadays, who isn't like that? I think a lot of people could easily relate to Miss Emily Wilde. I love the characters in this book so much. But with that noted, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today and learning a little bit more about the books I read in the month of May and my thoughts and opinions on those books. I would love to hear down in the comments below what books you guys read. Were there any five star books you read? Were there any one star books you read? <laughs> Let me know down below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel, turn on those notifications, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye.